Thank you very much for that introduction. It's, it's lovely to be, to be here. I, um, I came uh, over from London uh, just a few hours ago. I'm not actually from England, I'm actually from New Zealand. Um, so hence the, uh, hence the accent if you're trying to, uh, trying to place it. So I'm drinking water, you'll notice I'll transition into the wine probably about 10 minutes in. So um, just in case you see a change in the, in the color of my glass. The book is uh, uh, it's very bright, I've just noticed. It's very, um, <laughs> it's very pink. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, and, and the um, cover, I have to, just have to tell you, it's not me. Um, some people have asked, is this what happens to, when you work in a university too long? Um, but it's not me. Um, so thank you very much for coming along. It's lovely to be here. Thank you to Full Circle as well. So I'm just going to really kind of roughly give you a rundown on what this book is about. Um, it, it, as you can see, it's quite thick and there's quite a lot involved. Um, it took me uh, two or three years uh, uh, to write it. So what I'm going to do is just give you a couple of really rough kind of bird's eye view themes um, about what I'm trying to convey in this book, um, The Death of Homo Economicus. It's a bit of a dramatic title. Um, I guess I've had a little bit of poetic license there to get, you, get, to get the reader's attention. But, um, but um, on, a, on, a, on a more serious note, what I've been trying to do um, in this work and my more general research area is to really kind of question this idea of economic man, Homo economicus, that is at the heart of so much um, economic theory um, today. So starting back with the neoclassical ideas of Friedman, the Chicago School, um, unfortunately I had to read all of that stuff um, for this book, um, which I don't recommend you doing um, anytime soon, but um, right through to mainstream economics, um, human capital theory and so forth. Now, um, one thing that I really noticed in looking at, so Homo economicus, the assumption, this kind of idealized version of what it means to be a human being, very ontological assumptions, basically saying that at, at, if you boil, boil us down, first of all, every, everything, we can do, everything we do can be framed in economic terms. It's just not a compartment on the, on the side, it's everything, um, life itself. Um, and that we are really kind of driven by self-interest, um, utility maximization, in other words, kind of trying to get as much of the good stuff that we like, um, and, um, and very rational, yep. But what I'm thinking, I think is interest, interesting is that in this particular body of work, and it's very diverse, so I'm, being, I'm, I'm kind of throwing them all into the same category, so obviously they're very different, they're different in their own ways but by and large, really kind of decollectivizes what the social, uh, the social is, society, the workforce, et cetera, et cetera. No longer talking about economic, uh, uh, broad sociological categories like the workforce, but individual economic agents. And that has certain implications that I think are quite interesting um, for understanding what's going, going on around us today. Um, so when I did start, began to research uh, Homo economicus and the theory, first, the first thing, there's, there's no people involved, right? And in the equations of um, human capital theory, Gary Becker read a lot of that stuff, um, the, the person is this idealized economic agent. There are no real flesh people like us involved. Um, so what I wanted to do, uh, look at, now that would be fine if all of this was in economic journals, but since the 1980s, society in many OECD countries has been rebuilt around the idea that this persona is the only game in town. Um, so um, neoliberalism, redesigning schools, redesigning the marketplace, redesigning state institutions, uh, you know, to the point where even Gary Becker says, you know, you can look at drug addiction through this lens, marriage, um, romance, 
or all can be boiled down to the self-interested economic agent. So, the first thing to real, uh, the first th thing that I notice is that, you know, there, there aren't any. There's there's no one there, basically. And I thought, okay, this is quite uh, surprising. We've rebuilt our society around. Uh, the assumption that this is um, how, what drives us, but in all of the abstract theory there are no real people. The second thing that I noticed as well is that a lot of critiques of homo economicus were basically, um, you know, uh, personified, were looking at relatively rich, greedy, semi-corrupt individuals. Um, the Gordon Geckos, uh, for those of you old enough to remember uh, Wall Street, the, the, uh, the film from the 80s, these Gordon Geckos, greed is good. You know, I'll step over my grandmother to make a profit um, and I'm going to get rich. Um, the American Psycho is, the another, is, a, is another one personified in, in, in popular culture. Uh, right through to the Wolf of uh, Wall Street, um, uh, you know, this kind of very rich person that's kind of really ruthlessly instrumental. And the idea, the critique of that person personification of homo economicus is, you know, how on earth did we create such a monster? Yeah? Uh, what were we thinking? How was it that this kind of person was validated and legitimated when in a previous era we might have kind of, you know, thought twice about promoting? And, you know, going back to Margaret Thatcher, um, uh, uh, whose ideas in ghostly form still inform so much of what happens in my society in England and I think elsewhere as well. You know, there is no such thing as a society. There's no such thing as a society. There are only individuals and maybe, at a stretch, their family. But other than that, this idea of society, we don't want to know about, too collective. Yeah? Um, which is interesting. So, you know, this greedy individual kind of emerges. But it didn't sit well with me, which is going to the heart of the book, that this kind of homo economicus is what the ultra-rich and the kind of the yuppies and the management consultants and the, the, wolves, the traders, the Wolf of Wall Street kind of characters, that this is what they are. My argument is this. The rich actually live a very quite socialist lifestyle in which a lot of this stuff is distasteful. Hence why Credit uh, Swiss just re released a, a billionaire's wealth report, you know, networks and family are very, very close. They do have a collective, uh, very gentle way of life. No, homo economicus was meant for us. Yep. Um, homo economicus was meant for those who are least likely to be able to live up to that ideal. Um, if you want to really see where homo economicus is being promoted, go into a job centre where the unemployed are. Yeah. Uh, look at the working poor. Uh, the debt, kind of indebt uh, indebted uh, credit card uh, 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 kind of uh, victim in so many neoclassical um, inspired societies. So that was kind of my first argument that really, you know, if you want to see where it's the, this impossible idea of an economic agent is really, sell it, is really pushed. It's kind of you know, middle classes and on your way down. Now, that then leads to the cover, in fact, you know. Um, when society is rebuilt in this way, you know, we all don't end up as these Richard Branson types. You know, so this is the way the enterprise entrepreneur, you know, that you know, anyone can come, become rich, et cetera, et cetera. What we really see are kind of casualties. So when I put a person in these equations and formulas and then began to look around about what was happening, particularly in post-2007, 2008, uh, uh, economies that had really been hit hard by the crisis, instead of these kind of winners, what I really saw and really wanted to kind of point out uh, were, were, were the victims. Yep. Those where the body literally, and I mean this, was literally breaking down. 
And so the death of Homo economicus uh, is, 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 is kind of be, uh, supposed to give meaning in two ways. First of all, you know, the, the, uh, many of the formulas when put into human bodies does quite a lot of damage at the moment. And I'll talk about two that, is, uh, that I discuss in the book. But also, um, on a more normative, utopian, I guess, um, uh, 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 note, um, the book is trying to say, look, if this isn't working, why are, we, why are we peddling this still? If it isn't working, if personal debt is so bad, if work is no longer the path to prosperity, if human capital theory is so abstract it doesn't really work in any real sense, in a real community sense, then why are we still adhered, adhering to it? Um, and this is the great contradiction, I think, that we are living through. In 20, 30 years time, the contradiction would have um, resolved in one way or the other. But I think when economic historians or historians per se look back to our time right now, they would, they would note that we seem to be living in this very schizophrenic uh, kind of social space. Um, the ideas that we're using to organise work and economic life have failed except for the ultra-rich, the plutocracy. But nevertheless, we are living them as if they're the only ideas that matter, which is a really interesting tension. Hence, there's a lot of work coming out, out uh, speaking about you know, uh, zombie economics, um, you know, the walking dead. Um, these dead ideas are still haunting us, hauntology. And you can get all very kind of dramatic and, and poetic about it. So. Um, yeah, so that's the kind of the positive side of the book to kind of, okay, where do we go next? But what do I mean? You know, I just made a very bold claim. I just made a very bold claim. Um, and I've given, given this talk in various circles and, and, and often it's considered to be provocative. What do I mean that the idea of homo economic is, is killing us? What do I mean that this ideology is, being, is, is, is deeply harmful to us? Yeah? Not just impossible and abstract, but when put into institutional forms, is, is, is damaging. Well, I have two, uh, two cases. By the way, I don't have a clock, so, and you, realize, you probably realise by now, I can rant for, for, forever. I could be here for hours, <laughs> okay? Carry on, we'll tell you when you've got five minutes. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> I think I might make the transition. Do that. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, so the two, the two examples that I explore quite a lot in the book are, are work, so uh, I've been an analyst of, of employment, the historical development of employment, and the crisis, what I would call, of employment uh, today. And the second example is um, personal debt, which I think is really important. So what do I mean by a crisis of homo economicus in the realm of work? Um, well, um, well, first of all, it's all about income. So homo economicus and neoclassical economics, it's all about income and investing in your future, human capital theory. And so we have to get an income from somewhere. So that means that almost every aspect of what it means to be a human is redesigned around what does that human do for a living. Work becomes central. Uh, to the point, I would argue, to the point when it's no, not really any longer about uh, uh, concrete economic productivity. Um, there's a lot of work now that has kind of become self-referential and institutionalised. It's the ritual of work. A great study of uh, Management consultants in the United States found that, you know, it was expected that an 80-hour week was the norm. And if you weren't doing that, then you weren't productive. And so this researcher got in behind the scenes and talked to these workers, and the workers said, look, if we worked 80 hours a week, we'd be, first of all, unable to do anything. So our productivity would be shot, ironically enough. Um, and basically, we would be just wasting everyone's time. So the researcher said, so what do you do? It's like, well, we, we, we fake it. We give this veneer, and we only work 50 hours. Um, we only work 50 hours a week, but we actually get everything done. 
and probably better than if we were working that. So it gives you an in indication that there's this kind of institutionalization, right, of or ideology, I like to call it, of, of work. And so overwork has become an epidemic. Um, you know, it's not cultural critics like me that are talking about overwork uh, the most today. It's A, large companies, yeah, trying to figure out, you know, they've let the genie out of the bottle and now they realize that it's really killing productivity and it's creating all of these scandals. So how are we going to put the genie back in the bottle? So it's large companies, ironically enough, who are telling their workers, you're working too much. Um, and second of all, uh, 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 the, the medical profession, who are now kind of mopping up the aftermath. Yeah. Um, epidemiologists are, are studying it very, very closely. So because the, 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 the force of the force of stress that it puts on the human body is quite, quite dramatic. So they're putting it in the league with heavy smoking and, and so forth. So, so overwork is the, and I can give you some stories. Um, I've got some from the book um, about overwork. Um, some stories that are just phenomenal. Um, uh, and who here is an, who here is a workaholic? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll be, I'll, I might pick your brains for, for some stories, but the worst one that I come across was a corporate lawyer who quit. And I said, why did you quit? And he goes, um, he actually went to university. He quit because basically um, he saw some kind of self-harm, so much self-harm in the office. Yep. And the one story said one of his co-workers hadn't had a holiday for five years, and the company forced him you have to take two weeks off. We don't want to see you. You know, we're worried. And the guy goes, yeah, OK, sure. Um, and books a holiday with his partner to Crete, I think it was. And then they disappeared from the office, and they didn't expect to hear from him for two weeks. And then they realized, about three days in, that his emails were being cleared in a very compact one-hour period. And then three days later, cleared again. And they asked him when he got back to the office, what, what, what's going on here? What, what happened? And he said, if you want to know the truth, it was a living hell. <laughs> I could not sit on that beach and do nothing. It was like being swallowed up by a black hole. I was in crisis. So, I smuggled my Blackberry to the beach, told my partner that there was something bad about that meal last night. It might have been the seafood. Went to the bathroom and got his fix. <laughs> yeah. well, it's one of, the, one of the weirdest forms of workaholic holic, uh, activity that I've ever seen. And so you've got all of this kind of overwork, uh, that's kind of the stress, blood pressure, heart disease linked to it, the sitting. Um, and that may sound like first world problems, and in some ways they are, um, you know, compared to uh, employment patterns around the world. But it's, it's telling that, that, that the, 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 the dominant institutions that once promoted work so much are now very worried about what it's doing to us. How much time do I have? Can I? few more minutes? Yeah, time Okay, fantastic. Okay. So, that's the, that's, um, that's, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in London, uh, the, another awful case, um, this, um, this intern who was working for the Bank of America, who, who basically, first of all, the culture was very masculine, so there's a very kind of macho element to kind of banking, and that overwork and damaging yourself from overwork was seen as a badge of honour, yeah? as a rite of passage. See, I'm using all of these anthrop anthropological terms, you know, it's not economics anymore, right? Mm. This rite of passage. And he worked for 73 hours straight. Went to the office, did his shift, come back, had a shower, back in, and, and, and died. Died, uh, died. Died in the shower, of all places. Um, and that really kind of put it on the spotlight. It's like, what's going on here? What on earth is happening here? Now, just a, a, very, just a very quick caveat. You know, this isn't 
what happens in every economy around the world, and it probably isn't what happens in every neoliberal, kind of neoclassical inspired economy, you know. So when I go back to New Zealand and talk to, uh, which had a major neoliberal re marketisation revolution in the 1980s, a really big one, when I talk to uh, my um, friends and family there, they're kind of like, it's like I'm talking about an alien world, <laughs> yep. Um, you know, so this is really London, kind of, and, and the major centres around the world that I'm talking about. Uh, the second uh, 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 kind of moment of death that I thought was really pertinent to understanding more fully, you know, again, putting people in the equations, right? No people in there. What happens when you put them in? Is, um, is, is, is around personal debt, which has become massively problematic in, in most uh, in most OECD countries. Not only credit card, but mortgage, student loans, et cetera, et cetera. And this stems, this, the, the idea of debt and personal debt stems directly from, I would argue, neoclassical economics, especially human capital theory that said basically, look, if you recast people as responsible for their own economic well-being, yeah, that it's no longer a social good. You no longer have so, a pool of social or public goods. Everything's a private good. And when it comes to work, it's your skill. So you invest in your skill, right, yourself. And you know, the narrative changes. So all of a sudden, we say to ourselves, why should I as a taxpayer pay for someone else's education? That's their responsibility. They are the only ones that benefit. That all comes from human capital theory, and it's a ludicrous idea, right? Any, you know, the indirect positive externalities are really important when you have a vibrant, uh, uh, relatively publicly orientated uh, s uh, way of training people and skilling people. It's just better to have more doctors in the community. So anyway, all of a sudden, from the 1990s on in particular, when we want to get ahead, you know, as, as, and get the best jobs, it's your responsibility. And all of a sudden, this monster called the student loan debt emerges. Now, I do believe that edu uh, higher education is, is relatively subsidised in, in Belgium. Yeah. Very good idea. <laughs> Very good idea. I'll tell you why. Not only are you putting this huge economic onus onto 18-year-olds, yeah? so you have an 18-year-old that signs a dotted line to have a debt that will last for 30 or 40 years. Yeah? 30 or 40 years. So not only is that an issue, and then you've got all of the stress, you know, there's a, there's a suicide e epidemic in the UK at the moment because student debt has become so problematic. Uh, and it's really, really disturbing, and I talk about it a little bit in this book. But also, by basic, really conservative economic standards, we have a major problem, you know. So all of a sudden, you have people that aren't buying properties because they have a student loan, you have also a major skills deficit because you have lots of people that say, why would I even go to university and, and, and get a, sh a huge student debt that's going to hound me to the grave? Why would I do that? I will just go and pack groceries at the supermarket. Yep. And in fact, you have evidence now of a huge group. And if you think from a corporate, I'm thinking of corporate mentality, you want your talent pool to be the widest as possible, right? You don't want to be skewed towards, I taught at Cambridge University, by the way, and I can tell you, just because you go to Cambridge doesn't make you smart. <laughs> I, I come across some very interesting students, yep, um, who, were, who, were, who were lucky enough to be born into a rich family. So you kill meritocracy, and meritocracy is very important, even from that basic kind of um, um, approach. Um, and so you have a whole set of casualties along uh, along those lines. So work on the one hand, personal debt, it's a gloomy story and it's a gloomy analysis, but you know, what I'm trying to do is all of this stuff is so unspoken. This dark underbelly of neoclassical economics 
really is kind of privatized and that you know all of the negative effects you 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 live it by yourself yeah that's not a public issue you it's yours it's your problem and so and so it's really kind of uh, not in, you know the the, the 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 casualties that I'm looking at don't really enter into the narrative. So what I'm trying to do with this book is to say, look, this is what happens. You know, not to everyone, of course, but you know, putting real people into these equations and looking at kind of showing how there are some really negative outcomes that we see when this is the case. So where do we go from here? Well, first of all. I'm talking about a very sensitive issue. So one thing I had to do and make sure in this book is not to, uh, you know, not to take these real people dying lightly or, or be glib about it. It's a very sensitive issue. So it has to be treated with a lot of respect. So I've tried, I've tried to do that as much as I can. But to say that rather than homo economicus ruling our world, we need to kind of open things up a bit. We need to really kind of rethink the types of uh, templates that we are using to build our institutions. And they've got to be a little bit more socially orientated, and I think that's happening to a certain extent. Um, but, you know, they've got to be also more open to what I'm talking about is homo politicus, about not privatizing the harms of economic rationality that we're seeing, but talking about them and getting them out on the table and debating them. And building forums and institutional, uh, institutional spaces in which that dialogue can be, can be had. Um, and so this book is certainly not, you know, when I, whenever I give presentations on, on, on this book, the first question is, yeah, but what's the alternative? What's the alternative as if I've got this kind of chart that I unroll, this blueprint for a new society. Uh, I don't have one of those. And, um, and I'm not the right, I'm not qualified to, you know, I have the schools over here, I don't, it's not really what I do. But I think we should begin a conversation that a lot of the things that we're, a lot of the harms that we're seeing are not personal private pathologies. Um, you know, with the, uh, you see this in the, in the United States with the guns, the mass shootings. You know, the way in which the idea of gun control is, 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 is kind of silenced is that you begin to talk about what's wrong with the person, you know, what they're sick. And clearly they are, but also they're a product of an environment. Um, so beginning a conversation about what we can do, but just beginning the conversation and getting it out there, rather than it being hidden as this private uh, ordeal. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much for listening.